At my last house, I had, well, it was a very good arrangement. The letterbox was right near the driveway. I could just reach out of my car, grab the letters without getting out. It worked so well, I'm doing the same thing here. Oh dear. I think I might have damaged something. I'd better get someone to fix it. Oh dear. Looks like I've destroyed the water pipe and the phone line. This is similar to what happened to European settlers when they came to Australia. They didn't have phones, water pipes or letterboxes, but they did bring things they knew worked well in their home countries. Things like plants and farming techniques. And they couldn't see any reason why they would be a problem in Australia. They ripped out billions of native trees and plants and put in food crops that were familiar to them, but alien to this land. I honestly can't imagine it. The early stuff would have been done by hand and with horses, and then post-war mechanized. But they were clearing million hectares of year, a year, even in my lifetime. That's, that's a lot of work. And it, it established a lot of good farms, produced a lot of food for people. Land clearing seemed like a great idea at the time, but turned out to be a really big mistake. Like me in my letterbox, the farmers didn't explore what was underground. It was loaded with huge amounts of salt, just waiting to cause problems if they changed the balance of water in the soil. Salt's been accumulating at a rate of about 20 kilograms per hectare for uh, probably 30 to 100,000 years. Uh, in country like where we're standing, we've probably got uh, up to 5,000 to maybe 10,000 tonnes of salt stored under every hectare. And essentially prior to clearing, uh, what came in went out. So it was at equilibrium between salt coming in in rainfall and going out in runoff. Native trees and plants had been using up most of the rain. If the farmers had introduced plants that had deep roots and used up most of the rainfall, there probably wouldn't have been such a big problem. But most food crops and pastures have shallow roots and use small amounts of water near the surface. The rest soaks through to the underground water table, which rises and dissolves all the salt in the soil. This salt can then go wherever the water goes, killing plants and making rivers salty. The first thing farmers notice is dying plants. And I guess it was 20 years of, of really concentrated farming that was starting to indicate to us that there was something going wrong. We were starting to see nat native grasses disappear. Crop yields were st starting to um, deteriorate. The soil structure was changing. And about at the 20 year stage, we said, hey, we start to have to do, we, we have to do something about this. Eventually, people realised there was a connection between land clearing and salinity, but a lot of damage had already been done. Ian Stanley's family has been farming this land in Western Australia for three generations. I'd be guessing as to say when it was first noticed, but I know my father, long before I came home from school, my father was well aware of it. And they were aware on some of the lower um, valley floors that there was probably areas that shouldn't have been cleared, but that's always easy in hindsight. Um, and from when I came home, it was a, it was a, a real problem, and we've been um, battling with it or, or deriving ways of overcoming it since then. When Ian's father recognised the problem, he began planting thousands of trees. Ian has continued that work and has also dug huge ditches to drain away the salty water that could kill his crops. Even though he has these areas of wasteland on his farm, he's able to grow crops and make a living. His experience is alarmingly common in Australia. Latest estimates are that salinity has wrecked an area the size of Tasmania. The damage is spread around the country. Western Australia is the worst affected. Victoria has the second worst problem and South Australia is third. Although New South Wales doesn't rank very high, it does have a lot of land that is under threat. Tasmania and Queensland have relatively little and the Northern Territory has none. Nationally, much more land could be damaged by salinity if nothing is done. It's the greatest environmental threat facing Australia as we enter the 21st century. Uh, a recent national assessment revealed that an area more than twice the size of the state of Tasmania is at high risk of salt damage in the lifetime of today's school kids. 
As well as dry land salinity, there's another way that salt can affect food crops, by irrigation. Back in 1887, Canadians George and William Chaffee were granted land to start irrigation colonies in Mildura and Renmark. Their idea was to create orchards, vineyards and dairies using water from the Murray River. But the combination of clearing native bushland and pouring extra water onto it through irrigation created some salty wasteland. The Riverland is part of the Murray-Darling Basin, an area that stretches from Queensland through New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria and South Australia. It produces 40% of Australia's food, but also contributes to the nation's worsening salinity. The combination of land clearing and inefficient irrigation has turned rivers into salty waterways. Here's how it happens. Irrigation and rainwater not used by the crops soaks down and mixes with salt stored in the ground. The now salty water can go out two ways. It can go sideways through underground creeks that creep through the ground until they reach a river, increasing its salinity. It can also rise to the surface, causing dry land salinity. And this salt, along with excess irrigation water, is often washed down to add even more salt to the river. Changing the, uh, the cover of the country uh, from deep-rooted plants that grew all year round to plants that only grow for six months of the year have very small root systems and, and uh, very small uh, area above the ground in terms of leaves has made a very big difference. Since many of these crops are irrigated with river water, the salty water is put back onto the crops. Sometimes the only way to keep the salt moving is to over-irrigate. That increases the amount of salt going into the river. The big threat that we have in Australia, particularly in the Murray-Darling systems, is that the water we need for our irrigated crops and foods, because most of our food comes from irrigation, is under threat of being made so salty that it will kill the plants that we want to grow for our food. What's the answer? It's simple, really. Stop using so much water. Smart irrigators use very accurate drippers that deliver exactly the right amount of water to each plant. They also carefully watch the level of underground water. How? They use flags, something like this, which have floats on the bottom. This is our ground level, and this is the level of the water table. They're put into tubes that go about 1.2 metres down. If the underground water rises, it pushes the float and the flag higher and higher making it very easy to tell from above the ground. Rice farmer John Laurie, who has high water table and salinity problems, uses these flags on his property in New South Wales. And as a result of our continuing irrigation, we could see how the water table had risen. And it had risen to the stage where it was only 20 centimetres or 8 inches below the surface. And in doing that, we could then, then see that this flag was way up here and the water table was so high that it had pushed it right to the top. And we said, well, wow, we're going to drown, let alone all the other consequences associated with high water table, the increase in salinity and all the rest of it. So we had to introduce an initiative on the place to try and get that flag back down in the hole where you see it today. And that's happened over a period of six to eight months. One way of lowering the water table is to dig ditches or channels that drain the saline groundwater away to the sea. That's what they've done in the southeast of South Australia. But what happens if your farm is too far away from the sea to do that? West Australian farmer Robert Nixon is about 200 kilometres from the coast, so what he's done is put in bores that pump salty groundwater into a naturally saline lake system where it can't do any harm. The bores pump away about 200,000 litres, or four swimming pools, of water a day. This has succeeded in lowering the water table under his property. We're seeing better germinations and um, better um, crop production, ultimately yields. But that's a progressive thing. I think the first thing we've always got to bear in mind is we've got to stop the process from getting worse. Robert Nixon is lucky he can pump the salty water away from his property. Other farmers can't do that without causing damage to someone else's property. On our property, we've adopted the attitude that we will not let surface water off this property. Whereas in previous years, prior to 1990, 30% of the water used to go off this property. Now, whether it was full of salt, chemical or what, 
I would have said to you, so what? But there's a whole change in the area. There's a change in my attitude. We all have to peacefully coexist on this planet. We all have to produce food. Another way of lowering the underground water table is by what's called alley farming. That's where crops are grown in alleys or strips between rows of trees. Sometimes a combination of methods works the best. Kim Diamond is doing a good job combining ideas on his property in Western Australia. There are areas on all properties where the vegetation isn't using up the rain and excess water soaks straight through to the water table. This is what's called the recharge zone because it recharges or refills the underground streams. Kim has worked out that this top paddock is a recharge zone, so he's planted lots of trees to use up the water. His crop is planted along the slope. To control excess water, he's made ditches. They catch some of the water running over the surface and take it down to trenches at the bottom, which is called the discharge zone. The trenches drain away the water and the excess water problem is solved. And it would be even better if we could get rid of salinity, repair the environmental damage and make a profit too. We know that we can put trees back in the landscape, but how do we really convert them into wealth? How do we create an industry out of trees that meet multiple goals of uh, salinity control that will produce wood so fibre products, that wood fibre products we can use and also help us in our quest uh, to deal with the greenhouse issues. It sounds like too much to ask, but some scientists and farmers believe it's possible. Some native mallee trees can earn a dollar while reducing salinity. At this nursery in Western Australia, almost a million mallee seedlings are ready to be planted on wheat farms. Well, some plants and some mallees are specialised enough to grow uh, in the presence, or at least with the occasional presence of the com combination of waterlogging and salinity. Uh, but mostly what we want to do is go up onto the recharge uh, country from where the water comes so that we can uh, use that water and prevent this occurrence, this extensive occurrence of the combination of waterlogging with a lot of salt. Mallee trees have the added bonus of being able to regrow if they're cut down. That's because most of their trunk is underground. We'd be hopeful that uh, first harvest from mallees could occur at about age five um, and that the cycle after that would be between two and three years. Depending on uh, the, the proportion of wood we want in the, in, the, in the harvest, we might even go out to four years. Now, it's not much use going to all that trouble battling salinity if some people are still going to cause it. And because salinity can show up a long way from the cause and a long time afterwards, it's hard to get some people to listen. Land clearing is still going on in Queensland, even though it's known to cause salinity. Salinity hazard is very real in Queensland, and we have an opportunity to stop the clearing, do the analysis, and prevent salinisation over large areas of Queensland. I think until very recently, we hadn't begun to acknowledge that we're here to stay. We need to acknowledge that. We need to treat this country as though we're passing it on to the next generation and the one after that. And we want them to have the same level of shared prosperity that we've enjoyed, if not better. Now, it could cost a lot of money to fix the salinity problem, so farmers might need some financial help to change their practices. But once they do, their farms will become sustainable. Some experts believe the only way of solving the salinity problem is to make the solution profitable. In the long term, that will benefit the environment and the farmers. If you would like to purchase a copy of this series, contact ABC Video Program Sales on 1300 650 587.